Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, I can see that many people are back to the room, so we're gonna move forward on the agenda. And I think in the first panel, we touched about global marketing situations, and now in our second panel, we're gonna switch to Ukraine. And our second panel is called Ukraine, Economic Development in 2019, Trends and Scenarios. And I think here we're gonna really focus on things that worry all of us, from businesses to each and every Ukrainian, things like election cycle, things like progress with reforms, things like privatizations, things like cost of borrowing, and other things that are really, really important for all of us. So I think we're also going to touch what happened last year, how Ukraine did in 2018, but also what awaits us in 2019. What are the key risks and challenges? What Ukraine needs to do to really get to the next stage? What are some of the solutions and problems we're going to face? So I think before start of the panel, we'll do a short vote. Each of you has a small device with voting device. Can we have the vote, please? In your opinion, after presidential election and parliamentary elections, the pace of reforms will speed up, slow down, remain the same, or roll back. So to use the device, you press the button, you press the letter, and then you press the hand palm to vote. So I think the results are more or less clear. Most people think that the pace of the reforms will remain the same. About the same amount of people think that there is a speed up or slow down. And hope. luckily, not many people think that we will have a rollback. So I think here we can start our second panel, and I want to introduce you, you, the moderator, which is Yulia Kavaliv, head of the Office of the National Investment Council. Please welcome. Good morning, everybody. And I would like first to introduce uh, the honor speakers to that model. I will start with uh, Pavlo Kuchta, the advisor to Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, uh, Konstantin Mahaletsky, partner of Horizon Capital, um, uh, Olena Bilan, uh, Dragon Capital, Olena Slesarchuk um, from GP Morgan, and uh, Oleg Ostenko from Sigma Blazer. Um, I th uh, first, first of all, I think that um, the economic growth and the 12 quarters of permanent uh, economic growth uh, uh, that Ukraine economy was demonstrating, uh, double-digit inflation, uh, uh, was kind of a positive uh, influence on uh, both the further um, investments to, to the economy that we see from the uh, Investment Council that was actually um, um, one of the good arguments for the newcomers, for the new companies to come to Ukrainian market, for the existing companies to invest more in Ukraine. And uh, if we look back to, um, uh, to the members of the biggest business associations, most of them uh, admitted that the last year they were growing, they were hiring people, they, were double, they had the double digit growth of their revenues. And the same as they were um, positive uh, looking for the uh, development of the economy uh, for this year. And uh, actually, I think uh, we will today talk uh, on our panel a bit uh, about what was happening for the last two years and had that impact on a um, uh, growing economy, uh, stabilizing economy, as well as I think that is even more interesting part of our panel is what our speakers expect will be happening this year and the next year because um, this year is a very turbulent year uh, for, for, for the economy, for all of the country, because we are facing two elections, presidential elections, which are um, less than three weeks will be uh, voting in the uh, first round and then in autumn the parliamentary election. And of course, it has an impact uh, for the economy and uh, I think we will have today an opportunity uh, to hear from our panelists how they assume that will affect uh, economy, how they will affect um, uh, the excess of Ukraine and Ukrainian business to finance, to external finance as well. And I will start uh, my first question uh, to Pavlo Kuchta and Alech Ustenko. Um, if we look uh, back, what I mentioned, the economy is uh, growing uh, estimately 3.3 uh, percent this year, uh, 2018, and uh, but 
at the same time only around 1.1, which is the industrial output. Um, we hear a lot that the figures are not enough. Ukraine has this big potential of growing faster, quicker, 10, 15 percent, and so, so on. So my question is, um, in terms of this whole discussion, how quick the economy can grow, um, what are, where are we in terms of the potential? Can we grow faster? And what are the enablers to the economy to, uh, to grow past, uh, faster in that mid period of time, like a one, two, three years? Thank you very much for this question. Let me start uh, by saying the following. Uh, first of all, I'm definitely not happy as many of you here in terms of economic growth Ukraine was able to show over the last couple of years. It's definitely not enough and uh, war in the east of the country could not explain everything. Uh, and it's true that uh, despite the fact that we have great potential, we might have great potential for some time and then disappear from uh, the maps. It's also true in my view. I'm thinking in terms of economic growth and in terms of our economy and in terms of um, what has happened for quite a long period of time. I'm thinking in terms of Poland, for example. Since 1997 till the end of the last year, Polish economy was able to double, while Ukrainian economy was able to grow by 20%. On the first panel, you were discussing uh, in great details the experience of Turkey. Think in terms of Turkey. In 1991, Ukraine and Turkey was almost the same size. 70 billion uh, GDP, Ukraine, and the same is in Turkey. Um, number of population, 50 million here and 50 million there. Um, 27 years passed. Ukra Ukrainian GDP last year, 130 around, 130 billion, and Turkish almost 1 trillion. Number of population here is what? Less than 40 million, or around 40 million. In Turkey, it's 72 million. What has happened? Where we did so many mistakes, in my view, uh, when I was thinking uh, what was the main, I would say, source of future economic growth for Ukraine and what were the main obstacles in this country, why we were not able to grow as all the rest, the rest of the world. In my view, uh, the very important issue here is really this system we are still employing and this system is called oligarchs. I'm thinking in the uh, following ways. Uh, look, as I said, in 1991, the GDP in Ukraine was 70 billion. In current prices, this 70 billion supposed to be around 200 billion. But if you make an adjustment of these numbers by economic growth, we supposed to have, at the end of 2018, we supposed to have GDP on a level of around 400 billion. But in fact, we had this 130 billion. So meaning that somewhere around 250 billion, this is what we did not receive. This is our loss which we made because we did not move forward the reform agenda. So in my view, the Ukrainian economy should and might be growing at much faster pace. And 3% is not enough. It's already, you know, we are all sick and tired of this discussion, how fast we can grow. But in my view, in my view, we can really grow very fast. And I think that potential is in that we don't have we really don't have normal business environment, investment environment, whatever you called it. And uh, because of this, because of the mistakes, because of the huge vested interest, we are not able to grow. But if we have so 
so high level of shadow economy and based on OECD numbers, the level of the shadow economy is in, Uk in Ukraine is around 50%. If the ineffectiveness of Ukrainian economy is so high that even with very small investments, you can really make a huge rate of return. So ineffectiveness is so huge that you can really move forward this vehicle called Ukraine really much faster than it was, you know, moving so far. And another potential which we really have is, and we experienced for so many years, is a lack of political will. And I think that if there is a political will, if there is consensus in terms of what should be done and how we can improve the investment of business climate in the country, Ukraine will be able to grow at a level of, let's say, 7%, which will be okay, which will be okay for the country like Ukraine. And moreover, I think that if... The, the problem of Ukraine is not that you are not able to find interesting investment projects here. You can find interesting investment projects. But as everybody of us know, that investment, it's not about the rate of return. It's also about this beta coefficient in terms of the rate of risk you are receiving in the economy. And the problem of Ukraine is that, yes, the rate of return is high, but the beta coefficient, this level of risk is also so high. So in order to move forward the economy, you have to move down these beta coefficients the level of risk should go down. And they can go down only if we are moving forward the reform agenda. So I'm quite optimistic in, uh, optimistic in terms of Ukraine because we don't have the question, either we are growing 3% or we are growing lower or a little bit higher. No, the question is whether we are going to survive and because of that, we are going to grow at the rate of 7% plus, or we are going to be in a big, big trouble, including whether we, are, including, uh, whether we will be able to save ourselves on international maps. So I think that the question is in this format. Okay, so as I've got uh, like from your speech that the oligarchs with together with the political will are those enablers that can uh, support the further uh, more rapid economic growth. Uh, Pablo, what do you think of it? How uh, do you agree with that? Is there some magic stick uh, to uh, the next day after you have this political will to fight with all of the oligarchs? Is this is this, to your uh, mind, the, the key issues that are stopping the more, um, more economic growth? Well, um, I mean, definitely we are, uh, we are institutionally constrained, right? The business climate is a constraint. We know that that's a fact. Uh, question is, well, first of all, uh, yes, 3 and 3% 3 is rather low, I agree with that. That said, it's the fastest rate of economic growth in seven years. Right? And we're not comparing it with war years, we're comparing it with what was previously in 2012, 2013, when the economy ground to hold immediately after the commodity prices dropped. So we had a model of economy which was based on essentially exploiting the high level of commodity prices. Once they fell, growth was zero and we were teetering towards bankruptcy. And this has changed. So something has indeed changed after 2014, and it's important to know that and to understand, because uh, unfortunately my experience is that, and probably Yulia's as well, that there is no magic stick, it doesn't exist. You cannot change an abysmal business climate. You cannot change a country that has, and uh, this is a fact, the lowest level of economic freedom in Europe, right? If you look at the index of economic freedom by Heritage Foundation, the level for Ukraine is the lowest, lower than in authoritarian countries like Belarus or Russia. So a democratic country has lower economic freedom than authoritarian ones. Right? And that essentially summarizes the, the problem with business climate here. And you cannot change that overnight. There is no magic stick to change that. Yes, you need, you need political will for that. You need political capital for that. But uh, eventually it's constrained not only by some, a couple bad men who stop everything, but by the, the whole system, how it works in this country, by the preferences of the population, by how business is structured, by how politics is structured. You cannot change that like that on a whim. It will require major effort and many years to change that probably, right? 
Uh, second, actually to catch up, you know, I, I agree that Poland or maybe Turkey or something like that is a benchmark for us, right? Essentially what we're trying to do is to generate fast enough economic growth to catch up with these countries. But to catch up with them, we don't really need to, okay, well, 7% would do, also 5% would do. Anything above 4% for the long term and sustainable and stable would do. The question is how to make it fast enough and also sustainable and stable, right? Definitely, very unlikely, Ukraine will grow for many, many years at 7%. This is unrealistic to expect. Maybe in the beginning if some major reform efforts hit. If not, maybe at 4%, but uh, the question is and the challenge is to maintain that over the long term. Because if that rate of growth is maintained over the long term, Ukraine will catch up. If Ukraine slides into something, if something stupid gets down, if we drop, right, then we don't catch up. Even if we grow one year at 7% and drop by 10, we don't catch up. That doesn't achieve anything. And you know, you, for one year you can easily generate economic growth, print money, throw them around. You get economic growth one year, you get a drop and major contraction the next year. So we, we need sustainable economic policies that would generate long-term growth of 4 plus percent. That's what we need. Thank you, Pavlo. Um, and my next question um, will be more linked to... On, uh, okay. Uh, uh, very quick, uh, quick remark on, and actually reflect on what uh, Pablo said, just maybe to highlight the importance of the sustainable growth. Because locally there is a lot of discussion about the rate of growth. So if someone says 5% and another, and other politicians say that we need to grow at 7%. Some say at 10. Okay, <laughs> some say at 10, uh, but... Uh, Let's look at Poland, which is a benchmark for Ukraine. If you look at the 20-year history of Poland, uh, its growth rate, average growth rate was 4%. So Poland is not associated with kind of an economic tiger or something like this. But uh, Poland had not a single year of recession over 20 years. Even in 2009, Poland was the only country in the region who didn't have recession, declining output. So it's very important to have maybe moderate, but stable growth. So Ukraine is another extreme in this example. Ukraine was growing at 7% for several years in a row uh, before 2008 crisis. Great, everybody was happy, right? Salaries were growing at double digit rate, you know, banks were lending to everybody who is moving. Uh, so what we had after that, we had a very severe recession. And if you look at the longer period of Ukraine of 20 years, the average growth rate was 1% and Ukraine had eight years of declining output. So I, I would really um, I would like to see this discussion shift into kind of not the growth rate that we have, but how to make this growth rate really sustainable. And the answer would be productivity. I think we will discuss it later. Thanks. If, if I may add just one word. Yes, I agree. It, sustainability is very important. Absolutely. No doubt about that. But another issue which is also extremely important is inclusivity of these growth. The growth has to be inclusive. And from this point of view, we have also to, you know, to make our proposals and to make our policy recommendations for whoever is in um, the new presidential office or in the Ukrainian parliament. So it's also important. Alina, I think you also wanted to yeah. comment on um, this. Yeah, so basically I think in case of Ukraine, when we, we cannot even talk about potential growth. As, uh, as Elena mentioned, over the last 10 years we had two major recessions. So when you want to build a theoretical model, uh, trends don't make sense because the country going through military conflict, etc. Economic tools don't help you. Uh, so that's why talking about whether it's 2%, 1 or 5, you just cannot tell in case of Ukraine. Um, but what you can tell is for, for sustainable growth, you need growth, improvement of one of three factors, or all three. It's labor, capital, or total factor productivity. We know that Ukraine labor force is shrinking, um, right? Um, the workers go to uh, work in EU massively, so that doesn't help. In, in, in this case, the economy itself loses. Uh, so you need capital and total factor productivity, which means effectiveness with which you use your current resources. So capital means investment. You have domestic sources and you can attract foreign sources if the environment is uh, appropriate. 
And the total factor productivity, the effectiveness means that you must have much higher competition on the ground, and that also means lower corruption and better working institutions. Uh, so these are these are the target um, the target um, uh, f for reforms uh, for the next uh, political cycle. Thank you, Alina. And uh, I will I would like to come back to Olena, who first studied um, um, and pointing, I think, very deep on the issue of uh, not a steadily economic growth, but a roller coaster. When we see the Ukrainian chart of economic growth, it, it's kind of that. And you know that everybody is now talking on the next global crisis, whether it will happen in the, and start happening at the end of this year, where we'll be facing it in 2020, 2021. Uh, do you think Ukraine is ready for that? And do you think it, how deep that potential crisis can uh, tackle Ukrainian economy? And what's what we can still do, we have the time to preserve and to get ready for that? Well, I think it's very difficult to get ready for a crisis, otherwise we would not be kind of developing if you are always, always thinking about the crisis. But um, if, if you compare Ukraine now and uh, well to, to, to the previous kind of pre-crisis periods, I think that there are several areas where we have an advantage compared to previous crises. Uh, we have a little bit bigger buffers, I would say. And this concerns the macroeconomic, um, I don't know, or absence of macroeconomic misbalances. First in the external sector, and uh, sec second in the budget. So uh, just maybe a couple of numbers. Um, if you look at the uh, kind of this twin deficit, Ukraine still has a current account deficit and uh, um, budget deficit. But the numbers are completely different from what we had before. Uh, before the um, uh, 2008 crisis, uh, these two deficits together were 10% uh, of GDP. Before 2014, so basically when the economy was more or less stable uh, over um, the Yanukovych, uh, during the Yanukovych presidency, but these two uh, deficits together sum up to 15% of GDP. It's huge misbalances in the economy. Now we have the current account deficit of 3.5%, budget deficit of, of around 2%, so the sum is about 5-6%, which is much better than before. Now uh, we have, I think, uh, better institutions, we have a much better central bank, uh, we have um, the flexible exchange rate uh, policy, which would act as a caution against the uh, uh, crisis. Um, uh, we have cleaner banking system, uh, we have healthier uh, budget system, but it doesn't mean that we are really prepared. We have challenges, external debt repayments, um, and definitely the economy is, is still very vulnerable to, uh, to decline in uh, global commodity prices. So I would say that Ukraine is better, uh, more resilient to a global slowdown or some short-lived, maybe even recession, but if severe crisis uh, would hit, Ukraine will suffer a lot. And in this context, uh, you know, the cooperation with the international uh, creditors remains uh, very important in any case. Uh, thank you, uh, Alina. That's, I would also uh, like to hear from you, how do you think we uh, can still uh, protect, so to say, um, or are there some tools that still we have to, to protect from the potential future in a crisis? Um, first, probably we are not talking about the crisis which we had in 2008 with massive contraction of, uh, of external, uh, of, of foreign trade, or 2014 when, when Ukraine uh, faced uh, the double blow um, Right, so that's, uh, and, and so in delta terms, I don't see Ukraine economy shrinking uh, partially because it is now at the lower level and it's not booming. Uh, so, you know, it's, when you're not booming, it's harder to collapse. Uh, but um, I, um, I, I agree, I agree with uh, uh, Olena that um, we have better institutions, flexible exchange rate is an automatic um, stabilizer, so it, it Currently, it helps to respond to external pressures much quicker, to adjust domestic demand much faster, not tr wasting reserves, protecting Hrivna, and then, you know, devaluing um, 
10% plus in one day. Uh, so, so monetary policy, so overall macro policy setup, it's much better prepared for external shocks. Um, when we uh, build in our research department sovereign uh, strength indicators, or you can call them vulnerability indicators, uh, Ukraine looks much more stable than say 10 years ago. Um, but on a relative basis to other EMs, uh, it is still one of the most vulnerable in, in, in the set that we used um, in, the, in the CE space. Uh, it's an open economy, uh, it has double deficit, uh, and um, what, it, what it needs, uh, it needs continuous access to the international financial markets, right? So we have uh, external liabilities, uh, and, um, and, that's, and that, that part, so financing part of the balance of payments is very important to preserve. Thank you. Uh, Konstantin, um, you just, um, in the mid of January, Horizon Capital announced the new fund, 200 million new fund uh, with the um, investment in Ukraine. Uh, could you, it means actually that what Alina said previously, um, supporting the economic growth with investments, so you will uh, put your money into the businesses in Ukraine, creating the value added, supporting the exports, uh, from your standpoint, could you please share with us, um, um, was it hard to get the uh, investors on the ground with, uh, with relatively high ticket, 200 million, it's a high ticket for Ukraine, and what were your arguments, or maybe what, what were you praising Ukraine, Ukrainian government uh, for, uh, for the achievements for the last four years? And what were the most tough questions you got during that period of time. Thank you. Uh, yes, we did uh, just raise a new fund of $200 million. And we actually believe it's a very big uh, step, not just for Horizon, because it's, but for Ukraine overall. Because if you think about it, that's actually the largest uh, fund which was raised for Ukraine for the last 10 years, uh, this $200 million. The previous fund was also Horizon Fund <laughs> in 2008 of $390 million. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and we believe it's actually a very good sign for Ukraine in terms of, if you look at our investors, so from one side it's uh, EBRD, it's uh, USAID, I mean in American government, it's a lot of European governments such as French government, German government, uh, Danish government, Dutch government, so that means that from one side we have global partners who, are, who believe in Ukraine and who put their money into Ukraine by investing at the horizon. That's from one side. From another side, we have a lot of actually private investors, many of whom we cannot announce for confidentiality reasons, but that's like top-notch uh, global investors with uh, very well-known names, especially in this room, right? So we, we believe that this fund is actually a very good example that both uh, global investors, global partners uh, of Ukraine, both from business community and government, they believe in Ukraine and support in Ukraine. And we believe that's a very good sign, right? That's first thing. By the way, uh, I want to mention that we are here in a uh, financial professionals environment that uh, as a next step uh, of our fund, we are not just investing actively, right? We are expanding our team, guys. So we are looking for, uh, for investment associates, investment directors, and uh, you're all welcome to send us your resumes, go to our website, or take my business card. We're always happy to look to you. And that's actually another example that we believe uh, in Ukraine, in, uh, in investment climate, so and you are opportunities to make money. Yes? Huh? You are tackling unemployment, yes? You are tackling unemployment. We that? are improving, we are improving uh, the job market further. Uh, so coming back to your question. So the arguments, we are obviously both macro and micro level, right? And just for the record, we have a lot of, for, for macro experts here, I am not a macro expert, I am an M&A expert, investment expert, but I am more like uh, some industry expert than uh, macro. <clears throat> so uh, how do you convince, right? In terms of macro arguments, uh, main, something uh, was mentioned already, but in short, first of all, we do have, as Pablo mentioned, uh, quite stable growth for the last uh, several years, uh, and uh, that's very good dynamics. And uh, that's the highest level which we've had in quite a few years. Again, as Pablo mentioned, that's very important, uh, macro stability. Yes, maybe it's not 
double digit as, as we would like it to be. But as again, as previous uh, speakers mentioned, stability is very important for investors in, in terms of growth. And that's what Ukraine is showing, right? So macroeconomic stability. Uh, second, we have IMF program in place, right? That's very important. We have actually record high uh, reserves uh, at uh, 20 billion plus, right? That's record high probably for five years, if I recall correct. Uh, we have a free trade agreement with the European Union, right? That's very important. If you think about it, uh, the share of our trade with the European Union grew from 20% to 40%. It's now like by far, uh, if you look at European Union, uh, <clears throat> European Union as one entity, it's our by far uh, largest partner, right? And we grow, the trade is growing double digit with the European Union. It's very important, right? Uh, <clears throat> Also, uh, if we compare ourselves to 2008, right, uh, the situation is quite different. <laughs> Again, it, the fact that we are not exactly booming does help. Uh, unlike in 2008, uh, that's first. Uh, second is that, uh, again, we have much better debt management. Uh, we have, again, IMF program, and uh, we are not overheated, right? In 2007, uh, 2008, there was like uh, a boom in commodities, right? We don't have such boom now, right? We have much more balanced export, uh, much more reasonable prices, I would say. Uh, the share of agri and food, actually our export is also more balanced now as uh, both metallurgy and uh, agri approximately the same level, unlike before when we were much more dependent on metallurgy in, uh, than now. Uh, Obviously, now we have uh, remittances, which is a significant part uh, of uh, foreign currency exchange coming to Ukraine, and which does help to Ukrainian stability. And this number will be on, only growing, and that's good in terms of uh, grievous stability. And uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, a lot of support from, from our partners and very good uh, debt management. We have very strong NBU, we have very strong Ministry of Finance, uh, we have uh, reform oriented uh, government, and we could be a little bit critical of some things, but again, if you look at the pace of the reforms, we all wish there were more reforms during the last several years, but that's by far the highest number of reforms we have, we have ever had in our country. In a couple of years, we had more reforms than in the previous 10 or 15 years, right? And that's very important. Yes, we're all hungry, we're all ambitious, we all want more, but we should be realistic at the same time, right? So from this perspective, we are all uh, doing very well. Think. Uh, and, and my last uh, part yeah. of the question, what were those um, most, uh, I would say, um, how to say, uh, uh, tough questions from the investors community regarding Ukraine and its development uh, for you while you were doing your old shows? Obviously, I mean, we can't ignore the situation in Crimea and in the East, and that's probably your, one of the most popular questions which we were getting, but actually, despite I'm myself from the east of Ukraine, as many of you know, uh, it's still important to understand that in terms of uh, size of the territory and so on, it's actually not such a big part of Ukraine, right? And again, so from one side, when we were saying that our growth is not as fast as Turkey and so on, or Poland, yes, but I mean, they didn't go through the situation of 2014 and 15, which Ukraine, Ukraine had to go. If you look at the situation, we're actually doing pretty well in terms of GDP growth and many other things, and in terms of like political stability in the country. Uh, I, mean, I mean, if you look, for example, in, at, uh, at Paris, right, all this uh, revolts in Paris, we didn't have something like this in Ukraine in 2014 or 2015, despite uh, such a huge currency devaluation, uh, growth of prices and uh, so on and so forth, right? Uh, so uh, it's all easy, relatively easy to address, right? If you look again at the locomotives of our growth, like for example, agriculture and trade with the European Union, right? It's growing despite uh, 2014 and 2015 situation, despite uh, occupation of Donbass and Crimea. I mean, our trade still continues to grow, right? A very small part of Ukrainian agriculture was in the eastern Ukraine, right? So it didn't suffer much. It's continued to grow even despite 2014 and 2015 situation. So we are quite diversified. IT, right, and I will talk about it further later in more detail maybe, but I mean, IT doesn't depend also on Crimea or eastern Ukraine. It's number three uh, industry now in Ukraine and probably the fastest growing among all major sectors in Ukraine. So. We have a lot of positive answers, and obviously, despite all these issues which Ukraine had, 
we still have successful investors in Ukraine, right? And Horizon is one of them. I mean, we could be as positive in our answers to our investors, but without good performance of Horizon Fund and Horizon investors, we wouldn't uh, raise uh, this largest fund in 10 years in Ukraine. So the performance of the fund and uh, of Horizon-owned companies also helped. Thank you. Thank you. So what we've got from uh, this uh, announcement in the new fund of the Horizon, it's also a part of what Konstantin mentioned, the support of the foreign development institutions like EBRD, like Proparco and the others, IFC, USAID, who are uh, believing in the past of Ukraine and also from the private sector. And if you look on um, uh, our economy and especially on the deficit side, uh, we still I think nobody will argue that still will uh, need the support or further support of IMF and the other developing institutions in order to overcome this and next year uh, in terms of our debt management. Uh, and so my question is how uh, the panelists, and I maybe will start with uh, Pavlo, uh, see whether this progress with IMF or the World Bank just recently, a few days ago, Ministry of Finance announced the new um, deal of uh, 350 million deal um, with, with the guarantee of IFC. Um, so do you, first, do you still um, uh, believe that it is uh, one of the major supporter for macroeconomic stability is the cooperation was uh, uh, international uh, IMF and the other developing institutions that it's the one side so or can we survive as now some of the uh, politicians and the candidates saying that we can survive without them and whether we can what is more important whether we can deal with the programs we have signed during uh, this turbulent selection period well, if the politicians manage to come up with several billion dollars a year to our budget, then of course we can deal without them. Uh, but chances are these politicians will be a drain on the budget rather than, <laughs> rather than a contribution to it. Otherwise, of course, we need the IFIs at this point. Right? As Alina said, we essentially need uh, access, sustainable, reliable access to international financial markets. And at this point, uh, we don't really see that happening without a sustainable good relations with the IFIs and the availability of financing programs for them, mainly the IMF program. Right? The IMF program is the anchor to which everything else holds. Also, I wouldn't underestimate the role of these programs in, in sustaining reforms in Ukraine, right? The, the conditionality of the IMF has formed quite a lot of what has happened, has underpinned quite a lot of efforts. And uh, in a way, it is normal because, you know, the, all the major reforms have actually been politically very hard. Right, because they hurt quite a lot of people, quite a lot of power people, quite a lot of people in the street. They are politically tough. And uh, the availability, this conditionality, the, the fact that the country is pressured to do them to some degree by an external force, uh, which is kind of unavoidable for everyone, really makes it much easier and faster to do them. So, I mean, I, I doubt that the gas tariffs, for example, would have ever been tackled by Ukrainian politicians unless the situation was as it was and we were simply pressured into it. And regardless of who was in power, right? For, for quite a century, they couldn't have been tackled. And now it's, it's almost done. Alena? Yeah, it's a very interesting question because I think that IMF is really very important in terms of the macroeconomic stability and it contributed to reforms. But if you look at the Ukraine's achievements in reforms it, that were really sustained and were not rolled back, I think the critical factor was domestic leadership. So we have success in those areas where we had very strong domestic team and uh, maybe consensus with international uh, donor that this reform is really important for Ukraine. Look at the central bank, look at Prozoro, uh, here look at Naftogaz. Uh, here we had kind of a perfect mix of international support and the critical factor of uh, domestic uh, leadership. Um, yeah, uh, and actually Ukraine is able to do reforms without the IMF. The healthcare reform was never a um, uh, kind of a focus of the IMF program. It, it, it's something that Ukraine did uh, by itself, uh, again with, with, uh, with a strong uh, leader and a great team. So I would say that the 
IMF and other support, uh, support of international donors remains absolutely critical for macroeconomic stability and to deal with all the challenges to maintain access to uh, external markets and etc. But I'm pretty sure that Ukraine is now capable to do reform by itself. Oleg, what's, what's your point on uh, the need and the, still the urgency to, uh, to be a, a partners from IMF, the IMF program, and also a link to other macrofinance support to the country on the midterm? I would uh, say the following. In my view, yes, international institutions are extremely important, but not just because we need real money. It's not a question I would put the following way. It's not just about uh, ensuring financial stability of the country, because otherwise I don't know how Ukraine will be able to survive without, let's say, IMF support, for example. Look, you mentioned this last placement of 350 uh, million, but what was the interest rate? And what would be the interest rate? What? what, what what is the level of coupon Ukraine will be needed to pay if we don't have IMF program? What, 10, 10 plus? Is it sustainable? Is it okay for the country like Ukraine? In my view, why we need IMF and why we need other internationals? I would say because of this so-called sandwich effect. I want to put as much pressure as possible on whoever is in power in Ukraine. And the pressure has to come from both sides. One side is an international institution which will say, I would not give you money because you did not this and that. For example, in terms of anti-corruption practices. And the civil society in Ukraine is another force which is coming from the down, okay, from the bottom. The effect, th this sandwich effect is whoever is in power is really crucial in order to move forward the reform agenda. And what also important for me is that I don't want to see the case in Ukraine as we saw in some cases in the past, not in Ukraine but in other parts of the world, when internationals saw the positive effect in those areas where this effect was absent. And local governments were happy to report the effect and very positive, you know, movements in those areas where th they did almost nothing. So I don't want these delusions for both sides. And because of that, I really need to mention the following. Of course, uh, Kostya is right when you are th uh, thinking in terms of uh, remittances we are receiving. 12 billion, and this is actually what the people in Ukraine are saying in the government. Yes, it's a great story. 12 billion, you know, four times more than the size of our IMF program. But also think in terms of our long-term prospects, because we started from economic growth. Remember that we are, for those who studied economics, you know, several decades ago, as myself, and not many in this, uh, you know, whole, uh, those who studied at that time economics. But at that time we thought uh, in terms of Cap Douglas function, uh, there were two types of countries, labor intensive and capital intensive. And this, and Ukraine for me is definitely, at that time labor intensive was China and things has changed. But now for me Ukraine is labor intensive country. And think in terms of country where between three to eight million people already emigrated. So your labor was shrinking. You have much, much lower size of labor, the first component, which means that your long-term prospects are going to be under the stress. And it's quite possible that the rate of economic growth is going to down unless you are not able to deal with other components. This is the first thing. And another thing which I also keep in mind when I am uh, thinking in terms of this, you know, great story of remittances we are receiving here, and this is actually the explanation for many that 
why do we need IMF? Why do we need World Bank? Why do we need uh, macro financial support from EU? We are receiving, uh, you know, much greater amount of money from our uh, uh, labor migrants. And it's also very important to remember that the level of uh, unemployment in Ukraine based on ILO methodology last year was almost 10 percent. Almost 10 percent. No? Okay, close to 8 percent. Okay, close down from 9. Okay, around, I would say around, <laughs> around 10 percent. Okay, 8 percent, 8 percent. What would be what would be the level of unemployment in this country if we would not allow, you know, if we would not have that kind of but, you know, but Horizon level? But Horizon is now dealing with that, <laughs> what yes. we've heard. And also, uh, so, so basically, in, what I would like to say is that don't fool yourself that, you know, remittances are, you know, playing really a good role. Yes, in a short run, yes but in the longer prospects, no. And also think not just in terms of very short prospects, but longer prospects as well. In between 1911 to 1916, so 100 years ago, Ukraine, this is, uh, this is related to our export potential, Ukraine was an export-oriented territory within the Russian Empire. 80% at that time, 80% of Ukrainian export worth. Agro, food products, metals. Take a statistics from the last year. Almost 60%, we, we are independent, okay, but we are still export oriented. And 60% of our export is agro, food, metals, and chemicals. But 100 years has passed. <laughs> So also think in terms of, you know, greater, you know, greater uh, terms, longer terms, longer prospects. And do be, be very careful when you think that something would help you now. Yes, it might help you now, but in longer term, even in medium term, it might play, uh, you know, bad role for you. I, I see that Konstantin uh, want to comment, I think, not, not only for tackling unemployment, Yes, uh, <clears throat> in short, to address some of the earlier comments, and again, I uh, agree with some of them, but uh, again, it's discussion whether this glass of Ulena is half empty or half full, right? Yes, I mean, there is obviously negative sides of immigration, of labor immigration, right, to European Union. However, if you look on another side, right, a part of this 12 billion dollars a year, which helps, right, both to Ukraine and uh, to these people, and their families, by the way, as well. Uh, look at, let's look at Poland, right, 10, 15 uh, years ago, maybe even less, right? A lot of Polish people left Poland for Germany, for UK, for many other European Union countries. Uh, and there were also a lot of talks like this, right? We are losing people uh, and so on and so forth, right? What will happen to Poland? I mean, not, nothing happened, right? I mean, uh, they were growing each year, as uh, it was correctly pointed out. Uh, and even more, right, many of these people came back, right? They not just came back with money, right? They came back with new skills, they learned a lot, uh, and they created some, a lot of companies, a lot of businesses, and uh, so it's actually, if Ukraine will continue its phase of reforms, I, I would honestly expect a lot of these people to come back with new skills, with money, and to establish even more, uh, even more companies. I mean, uh, my uncle uh, was working in uh, Ukraine and collecting strawberries, right? Then he came back to Ukraine, uh, but this uh, big car and he is like now a small entrepreneur like delivering doors and stuff like this, right? So, I mean, there are uh, positive sides to it. Uh, so that's talking about immigration, right? Talking about labor intense, obviously we all would like to be Ukraine more capital intense and less labor intense and more productivity and so on. Yes, but let's be patient with it, right? Our IT industry, for example, was like hundreds of million dollars just like 10 years ago, right? Or 15 years ago. Now it's billions and billions and billions, right? Again, and people still complain, right? They complain that, oh, salaries are too high. Here we have a problem, it's too slow. People, if salaries are high, people still complain uh, because it's uh, not good for product companies, for example. And again, we have too many outsourcing. But again, we started from labor intensive in IT, right? 
uh, the idea what's working and so on. But now we have uh, Ukrainian unicorns, right? Like GitLab last year and so on. And we have more and more uh, IT product companies in Ukraine. Horizon started investments in IT with investment in Cyclum, right, from which we exited in 2015 by selling our stake to Soros. And uh, now, with, uh, now we are investing in Genesis, right, which is like the largest probably IT product company in Ukraine. So it just let's have a little bit of patience and we will have more examples like this in other countries uh, as well. And talking about unemployment, I mean, uh, there is this uh, joke, right, about there is like, Lie, very big lie in statistics, right? If you ask a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, CEOs, especially like of production companies, and you will tell them that, guys, unemployment is 8% or 9% or 10%, they will say, like, which 8%, right? We can't find people. I mean, it's, it's not easy to find an employee for many roles now, right? Uh, so from this perspective, I, I would be very careful in terms of uh, unemployment number in Ukraine. I think the situation is way much better than uh, statistics may think. And uh, unfortunately, we have an issue of unofficial unemployment in Ukraine, right? Which is getting better and better, the situation, but we still have this issue, right? So I think the realistic picture is very much more optimistic here. By the way, I will just in a second pass the floor to Alina, but by the way, if we look on the how the labor market was reacting to the crisis in Ukraine, in Greece, in Cyprus, and the others, we never saw in Ukraine the figures of 20, 23, 30% of unemployment, never. I think if the biggest was around 10, 10, 11% that was in the very peak of the crisis. So, um, and that was also very striking even for me, I was since that time working in the Ministry of Economy, we, we were getting the statistics, but the, the way the employees were behaving in Ukraine um, was much different than the ways the crisis faced uh, at that time. There was Cyprus, Greece, and so on, with the 30% people uh, out of work, getting the social payments for the burden for the budget. And in Ukraine, a lot of employees were more switching to half employment, to like a one day of week working, two day of week working, meaning what my personal outcome from that was that people were still uh, looking at and assuming that the crisis will be short and they don't want to lose much of their employees and that would better stay and a little bit decrease their incomes, their salary uh, level and their engagement in the, as the workforce, but to preserve the people. And what we hear now, and I fully agree with uh, Constantine that um, the labor market is now very competitive and it is on the employee side. Um, uh, where they are now the drivers uh, uh, on the market. And still, even with all of these figures uh, of migrants from 3 million to some of them are talking about 10, but like, let's be realistic, 10 million, it's just un impossible because we still have around 12% of working uh, actively uh, people. And that, um, and what we hear from uh, the Investment Council, like, uh, for the last year, there are a lot of newcomers who are coming to Ukraine and looking for uh, the greenfield investments, like a new factory, new production in Ukraine. And in comparison to Czech Republic, Poland, now Bulgaria, Slovakia, they have zero free labor force in those countries. And their strategy is to move to Ukraine, first they start from the western part, now going deeper and deeper to the territory of Ukraine, because uh, that is almost the only country within the Europe, Eastern Europe, where still the qualified labor is on the excess on the market. And now I'd like to, to, uh, to pass the floor to Alina to comment. Uh, yeah, just very briefly. <clears throat> Our discussion moved from, from IMF, IMF <laughs> to, to, to labor migrants. And um, overall, openness for the economy is very good, right? It's, it's good that you can travel, that you can work abroad, you can come back, you can bring back uh, experience, new values. Uh, so that's very positive, um, but it can work very differently. Uh, there is an example of Poland, um, right, uh, which, which can currently very benefits a lot from uh, 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 Ukrainian workers. And there is also example of Moldova, where you have most talent which left the country and never came back. So 
It is very important what is, what is happening within the economy, whether the environment which can attract back that talent is created, whether there are uh, new opportunities where people can come back and say we can be as successful or even more here. And, um, and otherwise, otherwise those 12 um, billion won't of, of, of migrants transfers won't help. Because looking at this year, households consumption accelerated to almost 9%, right? And, uh, and our growth is still at three because most of that, a uh, big part of those transfers and household consumption are directed to imported goods. So within the economy, we create, uh, we create some added value, we export it, but big part of, uh, big part of consumption just goes to imports and, uh, and doesn't generate growth. So I'll stop here. Um, thank you, and um, I will just ask you some tricky question because um, I need to ask it. Uh, I faced this for the last six months. I think uh, almost every, each of the second investor uh, who was coming to Ukraine uh, was asking our team the same question. So there was a, a lot of things that were done uh, for the last four years, and the, the country is on track, uh, uh, the GDP is growing, one-digit inflation, and so on. Um, is it irreversible? Or how quickly, or what are the risks, and what are the major achievements that could be irreversible because of um, uh, this uh, politics, and there are sometimes very uh, broad uh, promises the politicians are now doing within their um, uh, within their programs, but I would like to, to be our panel not to have any of the like a political colors. Just the question I will put that way: There are the programs of top three, five candidates who are running the campaign for the uh, presidency, uh, with uh, with no naming the name of the candidate. Could you please name the three most disturbing? so-called promises which are strictly put on into their programs that you think could uh, damage this uh, continuous economic growth, cooperation with IFIs and so on. Uh, Pablo, I will start maybe with you. Well, first one is the violation of the NBU independence, which unfortunately is somehow getting on the agenda of many of the candidates. And I'm, I'm speaking, this is probably the number one, right? This is the final red line. If they do that, then we are, to a very large extent, back to square one, back to where we were before 2014. So I think this is the most important, right? Uh, the second is, uh, but these signals have somehow dwindled, hopefully or fortunately, but uh, the, some of them were speaking about uh, dropping the IMF program, going on our own, uh, having our own pass, something like that. Uh, that is a danger as well, I believe. And the third one are the promises on, uh, you know, getting back to square one on the gas tariffs. Because again, this is the hardest, the toughest achievement. This was the most painful for the people. This is something that was driving Ukraine's dependence on Russia to a large extent. This is something that was driving Ukraine's macroeconomic instability and the threat of bankruptcy to the country. And if, again, if, if, if the politicians start to toy with that thing again, uh, then again, we'll be, to a large extent, back to square one. So I'd say these are the top three. Olena? Uh, fully agree, <laughs> but <laughs> I would like to add uh, another, um, maybe not really an economic thread, but the thread that is in, in, in the air is a shift away from the democratic values. Because some programs uh, of the candidates have like some proposals to uh, change the constitution, to, to uh, change the division of power in the country. Others don't have this uh, in the programs, but probably would like to stay in power uh, much longer um, uh, the, 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 <laughs> if not forever. Yeah, so uh, Ukraine is a very young democracy and uh, this is very important to sustain the democratic values for us. Oleg? Yes, I actually fully agree uh, with Olena. This is what I wanted to say. But uh, I, I, I would say the following. I think that the country is completely different from what we saw uh, several years ago. And yes, it's true, I agree that uh, some, some candidates want to, uh, you know, to keep the situation, to freeze the situation as we see it now, which I don't like. Uh, 
I think that each politician, each politician, whoever we are talking about, each politician can reach its maximum. Some of them has already reached its maximum. You, w this is the line when you cannot do more. This is, you, th this is the maximum which you were able to do. So, and when I'm thinking, you said uh, not to use the names, but when I'm thinking... No, 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 we're just not when, talking when, about when, the when politics. We, yes. we are, when, when we are talking just how politicians can influence uh, the track record of economic growth. Let's, I, uh, let's put it this way. Let me give you an example, which I already said to two out of these three uh, top uh, list Okay, candidates. we are talking to five, not to be... Not to put so direct fingers. Yeah, yeah, I will not. Um, as I said, many, many years ago when I was studying, uh, I had a professor called Robert Lawrence. He used to be um, a chief advisor on economics for Ronald Reagan. And this is a story which I said to two candidates already in Kiev. Uh, when uh, Ronald Reagan, this my professor, uh, was uh, preparing a speech uh, to Reagan. And Reagan, you rem if you don't remember, but Reagan was an actor before he became a president. He was an actor. And Reagan uh, was delivering a speech about the economics and also about the relations with China, which is actually very, you know, similar to what uh, President Trump is doing now. So, uh, but because he was an actor, he started uh, to play. So he was reading the text initially, but then he decided that, yes, I am an actor and I can tell from myself a little bit of improvisation. And then my professor said, and he started to say really very strange things, really very strange things. And we look at each other because he was uh, with his colleague who was also, you know, preparing this speech. And then he said, we said to each other, what he thinks he is. He is just a president of the country. His role is to read a speech which was prepared already by experts. And I think that we are going to have really good situation in the country, in Ukraine, if each of these candidates who are going to be in the presidential, uh, or in the presidential office will be reading the speech and will be doing those instructions which were prepared by experts. That's why it's really, you know, I mean, of course it's important who is going to be in the office of the president on Bankavaya Street, but I also think that the situation dramatically changed. Internationals and civil society will not allow you know, will not allow, completely will not allow, in my mind there is no way for that, you know, to move forward, uh, you know, completely different reform agenda. We, in my view, we are already, think in terms of train, we are already a train, Ukraine is a train. Yes, we are moving not too fast or even slow, our movement is very slow, but the road is already decided. You, you are not able to move, you know, to turn left or to turn right. The road is already here. You are a train, it's not a car. You are a train. So in my view, the risks are still here, but they are not that high. Okay, so as uh, Olena was trying to figure out some figures from around 10 to 8, I would also that just open Wikipedia. After he was an actor, he was serving for eight years as the governor of California. Yes. That is like a building the institutional capacity. Yeah. On the one more thing, I think what I agree with you fully, like uh, on the things that um, we have a very active uh, now part of the society. Let's be frank, it's only the part of the society. Part is here now, part is like a living in the big cities. But I fully agree uh, with you on the first, your comment when we just started our discussion that it is also a part of political leadership that need to be in place, also with that uh, prepared and well-trained civil, trained civil society, international um, uh, community and foreign support, but the leadership itself, whatever the chair is, the member of the parliament who will be elected, the president, he has to have his own leadership in place. And, um, 
Alina. I think you, it's also it's very interesting for us also to uh, hear. Have you read all those programs? Yeah, I had to. Uh, I had to. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's part of my job, and it's question number one, which. Uh, uh, fixed income, also equity investors ask. So yes, I did, and uh, I, I won't repeat uh, like uh, previous speakers. I agree that uh, you know national bank independence is key. Um, um, gas tariffs, so reversal of gas reform, would mean that we have again growing government debt, growing budget deficit, growing current account deficit, but temporarily happy households. So I, I see, uh, f first of all, I think nothing is irreversible, but there are things which, are, which have more inertia. And um, expectations of the society um, matter. So in 2013, it mattered that the society expected the EU trade deal, not the deal with Russia. Currently, it, uh, currently this society population um, expectations matter, and reversal of democratic values would not be welcome, would not go well. Uh, but what we also see is that reforms are never popular. It's a shift away from status quo, and there are groups uh, who lose. That's why currently we see a much higher demand for populism. And most, most candidates, not all, uh, but they, um, they have a populist agenda. And that is a risk, because if they really stick to that agenda, we're going into another boom-bust cycle. And people underappreciate that things can be worse, that things are not awful now, things are stable. At a, at a low level, but they are stable, and things can be much worse. Not not particularly better if you if you you know boost pensions, cut taxes. Uh, it will help to grow at five or seven percent in one year, but uh, at the year T plus one, we will go back to to recession and devaluation, etc. So I would say, yeah, populism is a risk. Reversal of reforms is a risk, and it all. Um, boils down to the cooperation with the IMF, which is the anchor for reforms. Um, the, um, it adds credibility uh, to Ukraine uh, in eyes of investors. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's, that's something we would watch after presidential elections, after parliamentary elections. I will like uh, Constant I will ask Constantin a, a little bit different question. Um, so you will now invest in Ukraine uh, your two hundred million dollars. We hope that this fund it's we, the, we actually invested like one third already with its six investments. How quick you are <laughs> on that. So you still will have more than uh, one hundred million and hope this fund is, will be the, the first one. What is your advice if we look to all of the range of politicians who are running the campaign. What should be in their programs uh, for the funds like Horizon to feel comfortable to increase investments and to successfully then sell your stake to strategic companies as you've done with uh, Erga Park and, and the others? Or do IPO? Yeah. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh Despite you asking a different question, I, I will answer. Uh, I will provide an answer to a different question as well to the but previous one. But you told one. me before you didn't want to. <laughs> uh, yes, so it won't be exactly an answer. As uh, you know, people who say jokes now are getting very popular in our country. I will try to follow this trend and will make uh, one more joke: uh, is that people align the most before elections, as you may know, during uh, the war and after hunting, right? So I believe it's very important to discount what we see in the programs of many, if not most, of the candidates. And uh, I fully agree that when uh, whoever will, will win elections, the actions will be, in many cases, much more conservative than uh, what was uh, written in the programs. You, you, whoever it will win will have to balance and to find a common language with IMF, will have to balance uh, we will have to be to be pro European Union because that's as Alina pointed out because that's the majority population is pro European Union, right? So that's uh, my comment to the to the previous uh, question. What's important for investors is basically 
They don't have to invent anything new. They just have actually, all the reforms are moving into the right direction, right? It's just that the train is not moving as fast sometimes as we all would like to be. So there is a good program with anti-corruption reform, right? With anti-corruption card. It should be continued, right? The parliament, and it's very important to remember, the parliament made these changes to the constitution, 334 people, 334 people deputies, just as 300, it's huge, it's more than three-fourths, right? It's like 80% plus. Of the, of Rada made this decision, Ukraine is pro-NATO and pro-EU, right? It's now in our constitution, so you cannot reverse it, right? Whoever will win president elections, whoever will win parliament elections will need more than 300 people votes, uh, people deputy votes, it, it's impossible, right, for the next several years, if, if not forever, uh, to get them. Uh, so basically, uh, it's important to continue the cooperation with IMF. Yes, there might be some minor changes and so on, but it's, it's very important. And obviously, land reform, uh, the government should, should accelerate. And obviously, big privatization also should be done a little bit faster to get strategic investors, to get the proper investors into the country, and to get more money, right? We need more arcelor metal steel uh, privatization types in Ukrainian cases. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Konstantin. And um, now I let, we still have a time both for questions and for the discussion. And I will have uh, my last question to you, which is more practical one. Um, just if I'm not mistaken, yesterday, two days ago, National Bank remained their rate on the same level. Uh, although, like we see the figures in terms of the inflation uh, on a quite relatively positive level, meaning they, they are low. However, we see that it means that the National Bank is more conservative uh, looking to the future um, uh, on, uh, on that. But of course, it depends a lot on the uh, corporate sector. And it depends a lot on the cost of capital uh, for the uh, corporate sector in the country. And uh, it's, it's well known and uh, we hear it personally that from a lot of businesses that uh, uh, the access to capital is one of the biggest issue in terms of development of especially the local business but also the foreign business in Ukraine is also uh, talking about we barely have no uh, project financing in uh, Ukraine for the corporate sector except for few sectors where IFIs uh, support them but like as, as for example in the renewable sector, they almost stopped to finance project as well. And of course it's a limit because the, the resources to develop the business is also either the, uh, the internal resources of the companies or the rates of uh, like somewhere from 18 to 19 percent of revenues, it means that you need to have like 20 plus return um, to, to be able to pay for that. Uh, so, for the coming year, do you still see any room for decreasing the rates of the market, um, Lena? Um, the short answer is yes, uh, but as many other things, it very much depends on the outcome of uh, uh, elections, both uh, uh, presidential and parliamentary. So if you look at purely the macro picture, it's uh, becoming kind of more benign. We have slow, slowing inflation, we have slowing inflation expectations, uh, we have quite a good external environment, uh, but we don't know anything about the uh, next uh, several weeks and what would happen just immediately after those uh, several weeks. What would be the first action of the new president and what would happen to the IMF program. We all have a hope and expectation that everything will be fine, but we will deal with, maybe with, with the politicians uh, who, with the politician who never has been a politician, right? Uh, so, um, uh, so it, it, it's really a lot of uncertainty going forward and this is important to understand that the central bank doesn't look at the past or at the present, it looks uh, forward and assesses the risks. And it would be very um, bad from the central bank credibility to start cutting interest rate when there is really kind of a lot of uh, uh, risks ahead. So assuming that the, whoever is elected will continue cooperation with the IMF, will 
pursue a right policies, will not do populistic things, will not cut gas tariffs or whatever, uh, I think there is a potential for a, a decline in, in domestic interest rate of uh, 200, 300 basis points. I think this year is still kind of a lot of, kind, uh, a lot, because there are a lot of domestic risks, uh, the central bank will, in any case, will be very careful with cutting its rate and will keep the real rate, so the difference between its uh, discount rate and inflation at a very high level of about 9%. But, well, if everything goes well, next year we'll have much quicker decline in domestic uh, rates and uh, that would be already, and the, the businesses would already feel it uh, in a positive way. Oleg, what's, what's your expectations on that? I would say that uh, the last movement which was done by the National Bank when they kept uh, the interest rate was not because of the macroeconomic fundamentals. In my view, they wanted to send a signal to the market that, look, we are independent and we have significant concerns and we would like to keep this interest rate on the level which, is, which it is now. Uh, otherwise, I would assume that based on macroeconomic conditions, they should be going down with an interest rate. On the other side, I do not believe that Ukraine can really accelerate its economic growth just because of doing some changes in monetary policy or fiscal policy. This is no way for Ukraine now. For Ukraine is much, much, much more important is uh, to make significant changes in business climate. Otherwise, what will you reach with going down with your interest rate. Just nothing. You're going to increase your imports because the reaction of uh, local production is going to be extremely low even if you decrease your interest rate. So your current account deficit is going uh, to grow and overall your deficit is going to grow and financial stability is going to be under stress. So you will not reach anything if you are playing just with the monetary policy. And it's also true that you will reach nothing if you play just with the fiscal policy be simply because you are not able to play with the fiscal policy just because you don't have so-called fiscal space. In order to stimulate your economy, you have to have fiscal space. You are still in deficit. So, again, the only way how you can stimulate or accelerate your economic growth is you have to move forward your reform agenda. Reform agenda in order to improve the business climate in the country. This is the most important and the most crucial thing which has to be done in this country. But I would also be very... I mean, I still have, of course, I still have a lot of concerns, but I'm quite positive in terms of the nearest future when I think after the presidential election, even further, when I think after the parliamentary election. Again, no matter who is going to be in the office uh, of the president, I think that, uh, wh why I have this feeling? Uh, first of all, I think that people everywhere, and in Ukraine in particular, have this, either it's bad habit or whatever you call it, but we are overestimating the results. Remember uh, Orange Revolution, remember Yushchenko in the office, remember when we were receiving, you know, significant boom for our economic growth, remember what was the increase of household spending at that time, you know, the economy was booming. Uh, and investors were coming, remember that we had two years in our new or modern economic history when the Ukraine was receiving 10 billion of FDIs annually. Last year, 1.7, and th at that time, two years we had more than 10 billion, 10 billion plus of FDIs coming to the country, which is a signal for me that international investors are also, you know, try to think more positive. We are all more optimistic probably than we should be. But this is the way how this world lives, you know. 
and whoever is in, uh, is in the presidential office, the expectations are going to be formed, the expectations are going to be positive, everybody is hoping for better. Then, of course, it's another issue whether we are going to have better later on or not. But immediately, it's going to be, uh, you know, expectations for something very positive or better. And investors are going to come because they are going to expect that it will be changes in the business climate. And uh, people are going, you know, to consume more, to spend more, and it's going to be also an extra impulse for economic growth of the country. So, I'm, uh, one more time, I, I'm quite, quite positive. Quite like positive in terms of Ukraine. If you allow me, I'll still, we, we are a little bit limited with the time, but I would like to uh, invite two, three questions uh, from the audience, if any, and uh, I would also encourage the panelists to answer rather quickly because the dinner is coming and the audience, I think it's the worst time uh, to talk long just <laughs> before the dinner. So. Okay, so you, you've got them. Well, there you'll be the Alfred second. Alfred Braus, Ukrainian Austrian Association and General Secretary of International Council of Business Associations and Chambers of Commerce. I would just like to sharpen some of the statements which are very right and to which I can't agree more. Um, foreign direct investment, this is in my personal view and in our view, the key and the driver of growth. And we had a, a rate of 1.5, 1.6%. And if you take the real GDP, the realistic GDP, including the shadow economy, it may be 1.2%. So this is a catastrophe. So what is needed? Business climate, you have certainly rightly mentioned and, and, and stated, this means trust by the international community, by the international investors. Trust, and what does it mean? First, rule of law, I make it short in catchwords. And secondly, it's the labor market, labor outflow and labor drain is hindering investment already. And Take can you uh, please a German company in Lutsk, for example, they had to decrease the workforce to half because there were no people available. Can so you please focus means, to your question because we so still have few minutes. Is, what can be done to concentrate on that? in order to decrease the labor outflow because you can't grow, you can't have foreign direct investment when there are no people available and this is happening all everywhere meanwhile. Okay, and I, I will uh, introduce to get all these three questions and then to, to answer it to save the time. Uh, there was a gentleman with the mic. I, sh Mr. Shost, uh, just a member. I just wanted to build up on the, on the question of the of distinguished colleague to the distinguished panel that uh, all right, so then I met the guys from Kazakhstan like 15 years ago, and they were really kind of, they made a grievance that the population of Kazakhstan is not enough to, to build up any national champions, because 80 million people is not enough for the business. And we are mo moving uh, very fast in that direction. So I, I, I like to disagree with the uh, with Konstantin here, because I mean, U Ukraine, Ukraine is the last resort for Europe, because where do you source the, the, the shortage of the, of the people to compensate for the outflow from Ukraine? From Russia? No. From what? From Kazakhstan? 18 million people? No. So we are stuck in this, city, in this uh, conundrum of, of shrinking population. And there's not enough population to build up the national champions already. And you could add up the general aversion to the, to the capital, to the anti organization program, which are uh, on, the, on the top of agenda of politicians and, and general people. And populace, and I mean, how would you grow national? And you need a certain amount of practical protectionism to, to build national champions. And if we that deep into relationship with the IMF and the likes, there would be no opportunity to, to, to build those protective barriers to, to grow, to nurture those national, uh, national champions. And a political uh, implication of that question, because um, as the population decreases, we might end up in the, in the Japanese trap, like they have zero real growth for the past 10 years, but they kind of, the, the GDP per capita it grows by, by like 20% over the past uh, uh, 
uh, 10 years because the population is shrinking. So the same could be in Ukraine. So you've got the same economy, you've got more resources for redistribution for the government. The government would, uh, would increase social transfers and would get, the, the, get on with the po uh, populist approach to the, to the managing the economy. And basically it's gonna stimulate any further progress of the Ukraine on the, on the way to the open economy and the, and the like. So we'll get back to the, this kind of redistribution because it's, I mean, we still have metals and agriculture and sorry, and I don't need, need, we do not need any, any more people to do that. So just get these exports, they just redistribute them between fewer people and the debate. So okay. it could be a, a kind of a political risk for the, for the progress of reform in Ukraine. Okay, so. and last, I will take last question, but my biggest ask is to formulate it quick. Maxim Maklak, South Capital. Um, I will have a short question. Putting the short, putting the short-term agenda aside and the elections and the short-term risks. And uh, question is, uh, we discussed uh, a potential crisis in the world in the previous panel. Uh, what, in your view, will be the extent of the crisis on Ukraine? Uh, to which extent it might hit Ukraine. It will be harder uh, or the heavier because Ukraine you know, is a weak economy compared to its peers, or the extent may be lower because the base is low and because we, we may have different problems. Thank you. Thank you, and let me then summarize the questions. First is what's the instrument uh, of creating the trust from the foreign investors? and to improve the business climate and to, as I've got the, whether we need to also to put the moderate protectionism in order to try to build some champion um, industries and how much uh, migration, whether it is a big issue and what to do with that. And the last question is about the crisis. I would introduce, I think, all of the speakers uh, with the initiative to answer. Uh, the only comment is to do it precisely quick. Can, can, I, can I start then? Uh, okay, so can I start with the national champions, please? You know, because I think uh, unless we have an authoritarian regime that is in firm control of the country, huge natural resources that provide us with big economies of scale, and at least controllable institutional environment, right, and not an uncontrolled corruption and, you know, absence of order that we have now, you don't build national champions in that environment. You know, it will not work. It might work in Kazakhstan with what they have, but it will not work here. You don't. You do it differently. You do reforms. You liberalize. You increase your position in the index of economic freedom. Then you get proper investment, and your citizens and businesses build up your country. You don't build national champions. We actually tried to do that. That's what Kuchma tried to do in the 90s. Now we have uh, a bunch of guys we call oligarchs. Their companies aren't growing that fast and aren't that successful. Neither are they very competitive in the international market. And uh, they are like a political scapegoat for everyone. Everyone hates them. So that's, that's the result of trying to build national champions in an environment that wasn't suited for that kind of thing. Right? So we don't do that. As for the labor drain, I think you know, there is a, a kind of um, a quick and wrong solution to that, and uh, quick, easy, and wrong, and a long, you know, hard and bright solution to that. And the wrong solution would be you know, to close the border and not let people out, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but that probably will not uh, be appreciated by the voters in this country. And the hard solution is to increase the level of economic development, increase, grow the GDP per capita, increase incomes of the population, and then they will stay, right? But uh, there is a caveat to that, because what we, we always speak about them uh, emigrating to Poland, for example, because wages are much higher there. But we don't really calculate into that that prices are also higher there. So Ukraine is cheap. Right? It, it, it will not take us to catch up with them by the level of wages for the, uh, this drain to start dwindling, right? If we grow fast enough, if there are many jobs opportunities here, it's already interesting. Actually, if we're speaking about IT sector, for example, uh, the quantity of IT personnel, I believe, is already about the same, but in Poland it's growing by about 5% per year, and here it's 20 plus percent per year, right? Because it's much cheaper here, and they get 
comparable wages, in fact. So we can tackle that. I mean, the instruments are here. We actually know what to do. Because Constantine was really right when he said that we, we know what, what reforms need to be done. We know more about, we, we understand more about what needs to be done than uh, we have the capacity to do quickly. Let's put it like that. Answer. No, no. If you if you would like to comment on those questions, I think that uh, we are a little bit running off. We have one minute to be uh, on the schedule, so like few minutes we will have just to comment on them. Okay, just uh, then very briefly on the national champion. I do agree. Uh, first, it's very difficult to really implement this in in a in a environment of a very young uh, democracy with a, a lot of uh, with a lot of corruption and also there is a, a big risk to make a mistake in choosing the the industry which would be a national champion the world is changing very fast we don't know uh, which profession our children uh, will will uh, will occupy at all which profession would be in fashion and uh, uh, profitable so we cannot say we cannot plan for a long period now so the best way is indeed to create an environment when the uh, uh, when the champions will grow by, by themselves. And the IT industry is an excellent example that, that is already happening. Nobody regulated the IT industry, and it's now a Ukraine's one, of the, one of the Ukraine's advantage. On labor migration, just um, uh, very shortly, according to the surveys, 63%, I think, of people go to Poland because of a higher salary. This is the main reason. They don't want to stay uh, here. Seventy percent of them want to return to the country. Uh, but uh, again, there is an, no easy answer to this question in general because this also may change. Immigration is a very complex, important problem. Uh, and uh, yeah, we should make sure that these people will, will want to go back to the country. But at the moment, the easiest solution is to pay them competitive salaries. Uh, there was a question on the crisis, whether it would hit hard or not. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to you because we don't know what kind of crisis is, uh, we are facing. And uh, as we discussed before, uh, Ukraine, will not, uh, Ukraine will suffer from a deep uh, uh, global crisis, is for sure. So we will have uh, uh, all the uh, kind of negative consequences, currency weakness, etc. Uh, the only thing that I am sure that now we have less mis misbalances in the economy. So even we, if we have such a deep crisis as was the case in 2008 and 9, Ukraine's economy uh, would not uh, uh, decline that deep as at that time. So we now like a better, a little bit better prepared. I just want to add that, of course, it's uh, easy to say that the salaries has. Uh, to be higher, have to be higher. But on the other side, uh, think in terms of salaries related to productivity. And if you don't have uh, the needed productivity growth, then definitely you're not able to increase your salaries. I mean, the, the, this is for sure. This is for sure you could not be done. But also, um, your question was really a very good uh, one. And I think that Something also important to keep in mind that you have, you, you said this brilliant word, you have, you have to have trust. Yes, you have to have trust because the economy and finance is not just about money, it's not just about numbers. It's also about trust. And if you don't have trust, you are not able to show the growth. And from this point of view, when we think in terms of improvements in business climate of the country, we also have to think in terms of rebuilding trust and how you can rebuild trust. First of all, you have to have prudent, you know, very logical, very, uh, you know, thoughtful po economic policies. But also true that you have to create certain conditions. And those certain conditions are for investors in particular, property rights protections. Without property rights protection, nobody is going to come to this country. And the second very important issue is that you have to have judicial system reform. Otherwise, you are going to go to court and then somebody from Bankavaya Street will be calling from your administration, is going to call to this Shevchenkovsky Rayon Nesut, and will provide them an instructions what kind of decisions 
should be made by this particular Shevchenkovsky rayon Nesut. So it doesn't work this way. So from this point of view, you have to have a judicial system. Reform. So reform of and justice of course, is crucial. Yeah, so yes. And plus, of course, of course, you have to decrease the level of corruption. It could not be the case that the country wants to, uh, to accept as much as possible FDIs, and we are still on uh, 120 rated by Transparency International uh, based on the Corruption Perception Index. 120. 120 of the country in, U in Europe, in Central, and e in Central and Eastern European region, is 120 based on Transparency International. This is definitely not acceptable. Alina? I will be really brief. <laughs> so, um, first on, um, about FDIs and right, how attractive we are, I mostly talk to fixed income clients, not to direct, investment, uh, direct, direct investors, but first question I get is not about labor force and not, a, not even about uh, the um, um, war on the east of Ukraine. First question is, uh, where, is, where are the anti-corruption reforms? Where is the judicial reform? Uh, are there any structural transformations? So um, labor situation is important, but there are other low-hanging fruits, including land reform, right, to employ resources within the country, make them work, make a country much more attractive for investors. That will increase the level of salaries that will make, um, that will make Ukraine much more attractive for local workers to stay. Shutting down the borders, protectionism never helps. Uh, those who want to leave, they will leave, um, just less legally. Look at our car industry or in any country where there is a high level of protectionism, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, so it's more about the opportunities. Uh, anything on, the, on, the, uh, on uh, the impact of a global crisis here, yeah, we answer at Ukraine is not booming, so in Delta terms, so the impact probably would be less, but there is still lots of uncertainty. And uh, in our short term, much more depends cu currently on the outcome of the uh, uh, double elections this year and how domestically a country wants to move forward. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to remind that we are a democratic country and we are open for advice from other countries and Horizon is cooperating with Austrian investors in particular, but I think it's important the way the advice from other countries are delivered. We are not a part of uh, Hungarian Austrian Empire anymore. I can't imagine anyone, uh, American, Ukrainian or French or British coming to Austria and teaching them uh, how to do business with Russia, whether the foreign minister should dance with uh, Putin or not at their wedding, or how to do money laundering with the banks and so on. So I believe that the question, the advice should be delivered in a little bit different way. That's my first comment. Uh, second comment about uh, national champions. Is actually, we, Ukraine is underestimating, for different reasons, the quality and the scale of the national champions which we already have. I can't recall a single uh, national champion from Kazakhstan, which did actually a lot of great reforms, but most of the national champions, if, if not all, it's all natural resources related, right? Nothing, non-natural resources, I don't know a single uh, Kazakhstan such national champion, but I do know a lot of national champions of Ukraine. Uh, for example, and actually, I, I don't know anything we import from Kazakhstan except maybe some natural resources, but like talking about our companies, we export juice, to Kazakhstan, we export bricks at, at, at the peak before Russia blocked uh, trade of Ukraine with Kazakhstan. We actually selling like 30% of our bricks, one of our company was selling to Kazakhstan, right? Just to give you some feeling, even now more than 10% is being sold to Kazakhstan. We sell juices, we sell bricks, we have sell household goods, talking about Ergopak and many other things, right? So I think some, from many perspectives, Ukraine, from something we can learn from Kazakhstan, but from many perspectives, we actually, in terms of non-natural resources, we are doing way much better. Our company is like, talking about Kazakhstan specifically, uh, and Genesis, actually, number one website, the most popular website in Kazakhstan is actually run by and owned by Ukrainian company, Genesis, it's Nurkaze. It's their most popular news website, just in case, right? Uh, but it's fully run from Ukraine, uh, or mostly run from Ukraine. Uh, another company of Genesis is the uh, number one marketplace in Nigeria, right? Uh, our company, Jubal, is number one, number two in 60 plus countries in the world as it comes to job aggregators, right? Or uh, Genesis is actually in, 
applications are at the very top, if not number one in, in US. Uh, the application better me as it comes to meditation and health and sports and many other things. So we actually, we do have a lot of such uh, national champions. Uh, and talking about preparedness for the crisis, the short answer no one knows, right? And really no one knows. Uh, and the previous crisis has have shown that, but uh, a little bit longer answer is that I fully agree with previous speakers that we are way much better prepared uh, for the crisis. And uh, to finish on the positive notes, let's all remember this Chinese expression that the crisis means an opportunity, right? Some people believe it's actually, it's, it's not, uh, they don't have such an expression, but le let's believe that they have, right? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers. I think, thank you for Constantine to uh, summarizing our panel on a positive mood. Uh, elections is also uh, a chance. Um, the good thing uh, that uh, we still have only months and a half with all of this uncertainty we discussed on this panel, at least at the first series, what is the presidential elections, then there will be the parliamentary, but of course it will be somehow linked the results as the, uh, the, the, the experts say. Um, so I would like to thank a lot to all of our panelists, thanks a lot to the audience for the questions, for the discussion, and uh, I will encourage you to if I'm not like a, taking your job to vote one more time. Okay, so let's do one quick vote really fast before we break for lunch. So I think we'll run it now. The questions are the same, and we'll just see whether the results are any different from what we had in the beginning. I think summing it up, there is still a great majority of people thinking that the pace of the reforms will remain the same, but hopefully I think the speed up part have eaten up significantly the slowing down part, which we will thank our moderator and panelist for convincing discussion. And I think now we can all break, do a short break for lunch, and after that we'll meet for the talking session with Andrew Fastov, ex-CFO of Enron in this room, and also in parallel a RADA business workshop which is, I think, by invitation only event. For those of you who have registered, you should go there. Okay, thank you.